So this weekend, The Predator opened in theaters and it's getting a very interesting response from both critics and audiences alike. And for me, this was one of my most anticipated movies of the year, so I've been dying to talk about it and unpack it with someone else. But before I dive into all this, just so you know, this is a spoiler-filled review where I'm going to walk through all the details, talk through all the nitty-gritty stuff about it. So if you haven't watched the movie yet, go watch my other review, go watch the movie, and then dive into this with us as we're going to go into it. But like I said, I wanted to talk about this movie because it was one of my most anticipated movies of the year, so I invited my good friend Cody Leach to come on over here because I know he was just as excited about this movie as I was. And Cody, go ahead and introduce yourself. What's going on, everybody? Some of you might remember me. Me and Sean did quite a few collabs back in the day, but for the other 47,000 of you that has <laughs> gained since then, um, if you haven't, if you don't recognize me, obviously my channel is the same as my name, Cody Leach. You can check it out on youtube.com slash Cody Leach channel. Do a lot of the same things that Sean does. I do movie reviews. I do some ranking videos. Um, it's a much more horror-focused channel, so if you're a fan of horror movies especially, there's a lot of good things over there. I'm getting ready to review the Halloween franchise leading up to the new film, so if you're a horror fan, fan or if you just want a different take on movies come on over and check it out and the reason I invited him over here is because he's got great insight, interesting take, and he's a fun, interesting personality. So as soon as this video is over, be sure to head on over to his channel right over there. Click subscribe, watch his review of the Predator his spoiler free one and tell him that I sent you over there. So before we kind of get started diving into the nitty gritty specifics of it, what was your level of anticipation for this movie? Go for it. So much, man. So much. And it's all because of the name Shane Black. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I'm a Shane Black fanatic. I've loved every movie that he's done. I loved Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I love the nice guys. I even loved Iron Man 3, which has a very kind of shaky reception. So this guy, to me, was the guy. Like, if there was any guy in Hollywood that could make a movie that could match, or at least come close to matching that original movie, it was Shane Black. So as soon as I read Shane Black has taken on the new Predator movie, I was like, there is no possible way way on earth that this is not going to be awesome uh, is everything that I've heard about it until very recently was good it seemed to be uh, he seemed like he was going to take it in a bold direction which if you get Shane Black that's what you're going to get um, he's a it was a shadow writer on the first film he had a small role in the first film so it just seemed like the perfect mm -hmm. setup to finally do a Predator sequel that is worthy of the name so right. a huge anticipation and he's one of these directors and writers that plays again goes against the grain both in the sense that he loves to be subversive go against the cliches and have fun with the cliches as well as the fact that he goes R like he crass jokes and he goes for it in his movies mm -hmm. politically incorrect stuff so if you're going to do a predator throw back to a 30 year old 80s R rated action movie there's a bunch of great things about that. And then they put the cast out every, you know, whatever, two years ago, whenever they first started shooting the thing. And there's a bunch of great names in there um, that was like, Thomas Jane's going to be in this. Well, that'd be cool. Sterling K. Brown, a bunch of these names was like, wow, they're, they're like, they're getting some, they're not going for like A-listers, but they're going for good character actors to populate the film, which is a lot of what made the first movie work is that there were just all these big personalities sprinkled throughout it. So likewise for me, I was, I think, when I did my most anticipated for 2018 back in January, this might've been my number one. Like I th it might, it was in my top three, definitely. And it kind of scooted down a little bit as the trailers came out. I was like, these aren't blowing me away as much as I'd hoped they were, but this was absolutely going into the year. One of my top three most anticipated movies of the year. So now we've both seen it. What's your initial quick impressions without diving into the details? soul crushing disappointment <laughs> i mean it, it's it's one of those things where like i walked out of the movie theater kind of lukewarm i was like yeah. well that was kind of odd there was things that i liked there was things that were really bad about it but yeah, i didn't hate myself i didn't hate myself for spending the money on it i didn't hate myself for spending two hours on it but yeah whatever put it in my back pocket move on and it's one of those movies that Every second that passed after I watched it, I started to dislike it more. The more I thought about it, the more the things that I liked started to feel like I couldn't remember them, but the things that I disliked, I started remembering more things. And it's just one of those movies that especially, which we're going to get into, once you start reading some of the behind the scenes stuff, yeah. which you had kind of you had kind of warned me about before I even saw the movie, and then I started reading it while I was in my truck in the parking lot of the movie theater. <laughs> When you think about and you start reading about what this movie was going to be and what it could have been, it's just 
unbelievably frustrating. And before we go too much further into this, if you look down below in the description, there's kind of an outline of what we're going to talk about with the time codes in the video. And we're going to talk about the reshoots. We're going to talk about the specific stuff. So if there's something topic in particular that you're excited to hear about us talk about, it's down below. You can see where it's going to be up. Yeah, for me, I, I kind of had this exact same response as you did. I watched it. And I was like, I'm not bored. There's some things about this that I'm having fun with. This is weird. There's some like big gigantic lapses in the logic here, but I, I'm not hating this. And then I started to think about it. It's like, what did I just watch? That was yeah. that was kind of an odd experience. And then I read kind of this art of the screen rant article that we're going to talk about later in this. And it's like, whoa, what did they do to this movie? But even aside from the radical reshifting shifting of things, there's some ideas in that are like, that was such an odd direction. That's such a weird, lazy version of an idea to put there that I, I'd be I'm going to be pretty shocked if this isn't my number one most disappointed movie of the year. Yes. Which, exactly. And that, that's that's what I was telling people in my review. I was like, look, this is far from the worst movie I've seen yes. this year, but I'm, I'm going ahead. I'm calling it right now. Mm -hmm. This is by far the most disappointing yes. experience I've had in the theater. Yeah. And like for me, I, I, in my reviews, I do kind of a letter grade. That's kind of the quality of the film in general. And then I have a number grade. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my in, enjoyment level. And this mm -hmm. is probably the one that has kind of the one of the larger gaps than normal, simply because watching the movie, I was like, that was kind of a train wreck, but I wasn't bored. And so it's kind of an interesting experience. I'm wondering how it will hold up to kind of multiple, multiple viewings. All right. From there, let's kind of yeah. kind of start off kind of superficial on this one. The humor. Shane Black's known for his dialogue. You're the bigger Shane Black fan. How was the dialogue, the humor, the interaction, all that fun stuff for you? That was one of the bigger disappointments. And that's one of the things, too, where I can't completely blame, blame the reshoots for the quality of the movie. I feel like this is the least effective Shane Black that I've ever seen Shane Black be. Like, that's the one aspect of the movie that I had absolutely no worries about. This is going to be a great script. It's going to have great character interactions. It's going to have great dialogue. If nothing else in the movie works, that's going to be awesome. And that was one of the aspects of the movie that worked the least for me. Like, there was maybe two lines of dialogue that were meant to be funny that I actually chuckled at and I mean chuckle like <laughs> like something like that it wasn't really like a gut laugh there wasn't anything that like the whole theater erupted into laughter and there was a fair amount of jokes that either fell flat or were almost embarrassing like I, I really struggle to believe that Shane Black wrote the script I mean all of the humor the humor is the most subjective part of the movie probably and I've, he I've heard a lot of people say that they laughed and they enjoyed themselves and they thought it was almost a great comedy not so much a great predator movie but on my end i mean you have the humor that was basically relegated to two characters thomas jane and key from key and peel key and uh, keegan michael key is basically just telling mama jokes for like 45 <laughs> minutes <laughs> And Thomas Jane, his shtick is he has the cliche Hollywood version of Tourette syndrome where he just spouts off a random cuss word at the end of his sentence every yeah. once in a while. And the movie, like the movie basically depends on you thinking that that is hilarious because they hammer it home right. over and over and over again. And if you don't think Thomas Jane suddenly cussing and like having a little tweak is hilarious, then it's going to annoy the hell out of you because he does it like 18 times until the third act when he never does it again. But we'll get into that. Yeah. And suddenly he, he's healed. He is getting yeah. going back to war <laughs> heals Tourette's apparently. Yeah. Um, I, I, for me, it probably worked better for me. I, maybe it was just the people I was with. Um, I was with. I went by myself, and my theater was I, yeah. mostly empty. But the people mm -hmm. that were in my theater sat right next to me. <laughs> like, and it was these mm -hmm. young guys, and they seemed pretty immature. And so I guess maybe I was laughing along with them. And and so maybe it was just like the right energy or something like that. I was trying to fit in with the cool college kids or something. But I was mm -hmm. laughing. There were some lines in there. It was like that's pretty funny. And maybe it's just kind of like I felt like uh, there's a dry spell in crass inappropriate locker room humor in movies um yeah. that so some of it i was like ah finally i can laugh at jokes like this in a movie that's not you know a seth rogan stoner comedy or something like that and so mm -hmm. it definitely made me laugh at times but at the same time in light of some of the controversy surrounding it there's a couple jokes in there where it got uncomfortable like the tourette joke in the hotel room with olivia munn and it holds yeah. out on it and you're like okay i can see why she was very uncomfortable with who like yeah. you cast a sexual predator and then you're making jokes like this okay i 
in this context, I fully far more understand where she's coming from, where she's saying she feels alone. She feels isolated um, and she was uncomfortable with all of the details of it. That makes so much more sense in light of um, all of those details. Um, would you you'd agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Because that was a that was one of the jokes where I was like, that wasn't really all that funny. It felt it felt overwritten. Yeah. And then they like there's there's times when a movie will double down on a bad joke. This movie like quadruple. Quadruple. Yeah. It. Like it, it, it it's oh. it literally like you said. It's it holds out this one joke praying that you think it's hilarious for like a good 45 seconds and it's the longest 45 seconds in the world if you think it's ridiculous <laughs> right well and we'll get into this later but it's a movie that one of the biggest problems is that it's trimmed so tight they clearly took mm. a long movie trimmed it down short and so sequences kind of fly by it never stops to breathe until this joke mm. This one mm-hmm. joke, it lingers. This is the one that it decides to like, man, this Tourette's joke, this, this is a good one right here. It's like, uh, mm-hmm. that's a such a weird decision in, in with what they decided to do with the movie. All right, from the humor, and it kind of ties into this, um, how some of this works for you and your frustrations, but then the characters and the cast. So both mm-hmm. of those aspects, the cast themselves, how do they perform it? And then the characters, how did you feel about them? The cast themselves I like. It's a very varied cast. There's a lot of interesting names. Like we were talking about Thomas Jane. You got Thomas Jane. You got one half of Key and Peele. You've got Boyd Holbrook. You got Sterling K. Brown. You got Olivia Munn. I mean, it's a very varied cast. But um, as far as their characters and how their characters were written, I like Boyd Holbrook's character. I think that he's a much better attempt at kind of what they were going for with Adrian Brody. Yes, this yes, kind of this, this leaner, smaller guy, but he has a little bit of gruff, a little bit rough around the edges aspect to him. He doesn't feel like he's forcing it like Adrian Brody right. was, where it's just it's in your face and it, it, is, it almost ruins the movie where you're like, I'm not buying this lead character. And he's um, written in a way that he's a sniper. Like Arnold yeah. in the original one, he's written right out of the gate. He's grabbing guys' arms and flexing his muscles. Like the thing that makes mm. him the alpha is the fact that he's the biggest guy around. Whereas this guy's written, he's a sniper. He can shoot anything. Like he won't miss. And so they yeah. even kind of give it and they give him a personality where he's like reading between the lines. All right, you guys are trying to set me up to be crazy. So they give him all these other things that are distinct about him. He's not Arnold clone. Mm-hmm. Yes, and he felt like a Shane Black character, the way that he was written, the way that he was kind of being a, a smart ass for certain yep. things and never really took too much seriously. He was having little one liners and quips here and there. He never went too far with it, but it was just like little little one off little lines here and there. So I liked him. I liked what they did with him. I'm usually somebody that dislikes Olivia Munn pretty harshly. Like when she was in X Men and other movies, I just never feel like she adds anything but eye candy. And I thought she was pretty decent. You know, I mean it's that she wasn't obviously like the first pick that I would have for this right. role, but she didn't distract from the movie. I wasn't like, why is Olivia Munn having lines in this scene? Like, she was pretty decent. Sterling uh, K. Brown. As a, as a character, as a character, like her performance I was fine with, seemed mm-hmm. a little bit overwritten as like, why is she so good at jumping in on the action? Yeah. Like, yeah. and it's not, not opposed to the fact that she jumped in on the action, but she's good at it. Like, you understand why everyone mm-hmm. else is able to battle predators and things. But I was like, why is she able to jump on top of stuff and shoot at things accurately? I don't think they've given us a reason in this. Did they give us any sort of explanation? Isn't she just a scientist that's really pretty and can fight people? Just kind exactly. of. Exactly. And that's that's one of the problems with the script, too. There's a lot of conveniences, which yeah. I think we'll get into we'll that get as in well. a little bit. That's what, yeah, but the, the, the one of the more tense scenes in the movie, or really the only tense scene in the movie, is when the Predator first wakes up in this lab, and she has to decontaminate yes. herself really mm-hmm. quick while the thing is just laying waste mm-hmm. to everybody. So that's that's really the only time the movie feels like a legit horror movie is that scene, mm-hmm. and she does pretty good in it. Yeah. So it's her, she's one of the reasons. So I liked her. Sterling K. Brown is entertaining for what he is. I've seen him more on shows like Supernatural, where he's kind of an entertaining character than I have with some of his more serious stuff. So, Have you seen This Is Us? I have not. So that's where I primarily know him from, from This Is Us. And it's it's weird because he's so good at This Is Us. And he's like this super nice guy. And that's his mm-hmm. flaw is that he's too nice and giving. And then you see him in this movie where he's the opposite. He's just totally <laughs> like doesn't care about anyone or anything other than his mission. And it's like this weird like he's just yeah, like so different. And he sells both of them while being like, what's well, him? But and he looks just like mm-hmm. him, but he just like pulls off two totally different personalities. 
Yeah, the comparison that I made in my review was that he's basically like the characters in Die Hard, the FBI agents Johnson and Johnson mm -hmm. that show up, where they just they show up, they don't care what you have to say, they're there to do their job. We're antagonistic because we won't listen. Yeah, and that's kind of his character. The only problem I had really with his character, which goes back to the convenience of the script, which we'll dive more into, is that it felt like he always had the answer. It felt like every time something would happen, he knew exactly what the predator was doing, exactly what the motivation was, uh, things that he would never know, and it just felt like yeah. writing conveniences. It felt what, like they, the movie didn't want to. Go ahead. What better? Like yeah, in the first third of the movie, it's not like that. But as soon as things get mm -hmm. going and they lose control, suddenly. Like he has all this backstory, like all this information, yeah. like, why does he suddenly have this? And I think we'll get it. Maybe it, it explains it later on when we get into the reshoot stuff about him. They had to mix characters mm -hmm. together with Edward James Olmos. Um, mm -hmm. We'll get into that later. That's probably what happened is that he was written one way at the beginning. He doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And then when he's supposed to be informed by this other character that was cut, suddenly his character is just an exposition dump of like just knows things. Yeah, and his character basically gets regulated to the the exactly what you said, the exposition dump. Instead of the movie taking the time to take us on to like a five, ten minute journey to find this answer, they just pop in Sterling K. Brown's face and he'll tell us exactly what it is and then leave. Um, but as far as the, the main group, uh, the loonies, I never really connected with any of them. I never really bought them as a group. I never really bought into them. And part of it's because the humor didn't work for me. Their back and forth and their camaraderie never really landed. But it's just, it, it never really felt like an a effective group. Like, it de definitely didn't have the effectiveness that the first movie had with that group of soldiers. Right. It didn't even have the effectiveness of the wacky group of characters we had in Predators where there's tons of different personalities and different performances going on, but they still feel like they fit together. The Loonies just kind of felt like this weird group that almost felt like they were in the wrong movie to me. Um, it just it, Thomas Jane and Keegan Michael Key kind of having the camaraderie back and forth never quite worked. I forget that uh, Nebraska, I believe his name was, kind of like the tough guy of the group, putting cigarettes out on his tongue and stuff like that. That's he's coming out of. Uh, I believe that was the guy that did Moonlight, and I. He's supposed to be like the best friend character to Boyd Holbrook, but it never feel really feels like we got to go on that journey with them again, which again, we're probably going to attribute that to reshoots, but right. it was that, that, that actual specific group of characters just never felt like they fit in this movie to me. Yeah. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, they, they worked a little bit better to me, but, mm -hmm. um, just the, in general concept that for some reason, suddenly they're like, a guy goes, hey, I need to drive somewhere. So for the rest of the movie, they go along with him on an adventure battling aliens. Yeah. That's like the whole rationale. He's like, I need to drive somewhere. I need to get somewhere. They're like, we're in a bus. And then suddenly it's like their buddies that kind of chum up uh -huh. and literally team up with him for the rest of the movie until they're all dead. Um, yeah. No explanation as to why other than they're crazy. Um, that's probably mm -hmm. not the best writing. All right, let's kind of move forward a little bit to the story. And let's start kind of big picture, the general idea of the story, and then kind of move to the more specific kind of things that happen in there. Mm -hmm. For me, the I, I liked the general idea of the story, uh, at least part of it. There's too many aspects. So as we kind of dive into it, there's things I didn't like. But like the first... 20, 30 minutes of the movie as it was getting started and this guy uh, gets kind of wrapped up in this big adventure and a predator ship kind of crashes and he's trying to rescue his kid. I was like, there's a lot of potential for this to be an interesting movie. It's like on the run movie trying to get to something before the predator gets to it, but while being chased by the predator and a government agency that's also bad. That's like, I was thinking, wow, there's so much potential for this to be a good Predator movie that's different, that expands the world, that tells a bigger story than group of people in confined space get killed off until the final guy shows off against the Predator. And well, obviously, as the movie progresses and more elements are added, it, it gets watered down, has big issues. But in general, I like the direction of it. Yeah, I agree. Like the first uh, act of the movie and everything, like really the first half of the movie is pretty solid with where it's going. And it, I liked that, uh, and I knew Shane Black was going to do this, which is why I had a lot of anticipation for it. I like that it's going in left field. You know, it's not doing the traditional predator lands and now he's in this environment yeah. trying to hunt people. You know, and we've seen that. We've seen it in even the Alien versus Predator movies. The, mm -hmm. the humans are just kind of in the firefight. But um, I like the fact that we have just a, a predator being chased, 
lands on Earth, and then these humans are just kind of stuck in this situation, this bigger situation going on while it's happening, and things just unfold from there. And it's not necessarily a hunt movie. So I liked that. I liked how they were trying to kind of tie into the previous movies and try to expand the lore of the Predators, which it's about time to try to expand it a little bit or try to go in a different direction. Even whenever they were bringing up like hybrids and, you know, genetic modifications for the Predators, I mean, that seems like something that the Predators would do. Yeah. It seems like they only exist to make themselves better. So it perfectly fits. It might be off the wall on paper, but when you get into the flow of the franchise, I mean, these things only exist to hunt and to make themselves more badass. So, I mean, eventually, if they can unlock technology that, you know, self-destructs and has these heat visions and they can do intergalactic travel and everything, I'm sure they can do genetic modification. Mm -hmm. So it, that all makes sense. Um, and even the story, the small storyline they were going with with just Boyd Holbrook, just this random soldier of fortune you know, or mercenary, whatever he is, that kind of gets stuck in the situation. And then all of a sudden the government does what the government does and tries to just get rid of all evidence, whether it's a person that's valuable to our military or not. And he just knows how to play the game. And now his son, who's got yeah. this um, mental illness of, they keep calling him Asperger's, but I believe it was just autism that he had, but I could be wrong. But they, he has this mental illness which makes him an interesting character for what he's trying to unlock and what he's able to do with this predator technology that no other human that would find it could be able to do. And it kind of parallels a little bit with what they're hinting that they're going to go for with the predators. Yeah. So there's a lot of great setup, but it just, none of it ever feels like it comes to fruition. None of right. it feels like it's ever fully cooked. It feels like all these ideas, the great ones all the way down to the small ones. It feels like every single one of them just kind of gets chopped off at the knees halfway through the second act. Right. Well, and that's kind of the big issue is that it felt like they had so many ideas. They had two movies worth of ideas that they just kind of crammed into this one. Mm -hmm. And then they took this very long bloated movie and trimmed it down to under two hours. And so it's even tough to know, like, would would these plot lines have worked better in the full cut of the movie? Would we kind of have yeah. understood like they, this, the major theme of mental illness runs throughout the movie of you've got the loonies, you've got the kid with autism, Asperger's on the spectrum and the sort of idea out there. What if people with autism are kind of advanced and all these sorts of different ideas kind of in the movie? But because it's kind of trimmed down so much, it just feels that it doesn't connect right it doesn't you don't get to the end of it and you're like oh that felt like we really explored an idea it's like no you just put a bunch of similar types of things together into it and tried to trick me into thinking that they tied together um yeah. so yeah like from my mind it, it felt like they really needed to if they wanted the movie to be under two hours they needed to trim down some of these plot lines and I probably would have mm -hmm. cut out the kid is you know the chosen one because he has Asperger's and like I, that to me just felt like one too many kind of big reveals that didn't work that's the one that probably could yeah. have been cut the easiest to streamline things and you know it works towards into the third act of the movie it's like let's do a big reveal and no he's the one that the predator thinks is the true warrior which is like was this ludicrous <laughs> twist in the third act of the movie like so let's switch the genre of the film and suddenly they are being hunted by the predator. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, even that like one too many plot ideas in there of like now we're being chased and um, yeah, it, you, at that halfway point, it really does just all start to kind of unravel. Yeah. And it, it's just weird because it's just a lot of the conveniences along the way too just get in the way because like we're talking about the convenience of, you know, their place and time, the fact that he has these group of people that are crazy enough to go along with them. And then you get into the whole thing with the kid. And it's like, since when does the predator not just rip the spine out of the, the trophy kill? He's just going to kidnap the kid and allow them to save him. Um, right. and even to the point where you have the final fight with the predator, the, the big super predator or whatever. It's kind of a cliche in action movies to a degree, but it's annoying at this point when you have something that is decimating everything. Yep. Like the whole movie, nothing even has like mm -hmm. two hits at most on him. And then the final fight, he's just like knocking him out of the way and trying to do things like uh, like swatting him away like flies when yeah. you can just rip their heads Kill off them. in two seconds. And yeah, exactly. So when like the whole final third um, climax where they're fighting them, I'm just like, why is this predator not just mutilating them in two seconds? Like it's it, it, And you could understand it like in the first predator movie where the idea was 
Arnold is the alpha, so he wants to show down, like have the showdown between just the two of them. And that's yeah. why he's knocking him around and doing that stuff. But that doesn't make sense in this movie because it clearly establishes, no, the kid's the alpha. The kid's yeah. the lead one. These are the ones who are just the flies that I need to swat and kill real quick. But he doesn't. Mm-hmm. Speaking of other coincidences in there, even the kid's involvement in the movie, purely mm-hmm. coincidental. The oh, ship yeah. just happens to crash where Mr. Sniper guy is. And so then this just happens to tie back to government stuff. And he happens to know, oh, man, they're going to try and cover this up. So he happens to mail it to his family who just happens to the P.O. box, just happens to be filled up. So they just happen to take it to his house. His son just happens to be the chosen one (laughs) that's on the spectrum. I mean, the whole thing is just coincidence. There's no like plot reason that it ties. Like Mm. it's not a reason that happens. It it just happens to work out that way uh, coincidentally. Mm. Yeah, uh, and it, he uh, he ships every single piece of technology he steals, except for the one thing that just happens to save him in the third act. Yes. So he decides to swallow that for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> right, right. And coincidentally, it comes back like right as like, oh man, we need to go battle these guys. How are we going to beat them? Oh, my stomach. I've got night like what? <laughs> what? It, it just like even the sip like on the basic level, swallowing a piece of metal this big. I've never tried to do it, but. I'm pretty sure that jacks you up. An electronic device that you swallow with batteries in it. I think that jacks you up. Uh, And then how long passes between that event happening? Because he swallows that, sends something through the mail to his son, and then it comes back around that he just happens to get it back right at that moment. I mean, just coincidence. That's ridiculous. And what's the time frame for this movie? (laughs) Like It makes absolute... Bonkers. The time frame is a whole other chapter <laughs> yes. of this review in itself. I mean, you just got the you got that, you know, his digestion or lack thereof of this item. And then you have the whole thing with like, you know, there's a scene where the kid is walking with the predator mask and he accidentally yeah. kills this tweaker that yes. throws something at him. And then Sterling K. Brown references it like it was last right. week. Like, hey, remember whenever Halloween night like it was like fifteen minutes ago. Yeah, movie, right. And then and, and and, and then you get to the whole thing too in the third act, which is the big one that kind of scratched, made me scratch my head. Was you know they have this big sequence with this predator ship taking off, it flies you know, away. Boyd Holbrook, yeah, Boyd Holbrook and Moonlight guy get onto the ship. Well, Olivia Munn doesn't. She's on the ground, and this thing is in the air, flying full engine speed for like seven minutes, not stopping, and then crashes. And, and it within keeps a minute, showing she's right her there. Keep showing her back before, like it doesn't show her jump in a car and chase them. Doesn't show her jump on no. a motorcycle. It just shows her standing on the ground and then she just jumps out of nowhere and it all plays in real yeah, time like yeah hundreds of miles away easy <laughs> and she's just like i'm back it's just mm-hmm. when she showed up i was like what did she teleport like, what the right. hell? like is yeah. there another piece of alien technology they forgot to tell us about that she just appears places and so then in the yeah. story one more thing we got to talk about the last scene in the movie, the whole deal is like the alien. Well, actually, there's, but I guess even more things. So we got to talk. Let's we'll build up to that last one. So this big plot line in the movie mm-hmm. is that we've got rogue predators that are on the run, mm-hmm. and then they're being chased by the main predator guys. So our mm-hmm. predator guy is being chased because he wants to get to Earth with this technology to give it to us to save us. That's the, what he's trying to do. That's his motivation, right? Our, our That's rogue, what they tell us. The rogue, it, rogue predator is trying to do that. He shows up, and the first thing he does is kill a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. And then he's captured. And he's in a lab with the people that he wants to give this technology to. He wakes up, and then he kills a bunch of people and runs. Mm-hmm. And then after he's dead, we then learn, oh, no, what he was really trying to do was give us this technology. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> like, what am I like? It, what am I, what am I missing? It, guys in the comment section, if you have some explanation as to why the predator is trying to give us a gift by skinning us alive, I would love to understand the explanation for why this is happening. So then that yeah. happens. He gets killed by Hunter Aside person. That we, is, oh, whoops. Uh, yeah, aside from that, um, just the way that it plays out in the movie not making any sense, that's never fit with the M.O. of the Predator in this entire franchise. Right. Like, even in Alien vs. Predator, when he teams up with Santa Lathan, it is only because he knows he needs a partner to yep. destroy this queen. 
And if that wasn't the case, he would have skinned her alive right there. Like there's there's no honor among thieves as far as predators right. are concerned. You know, we're we're it's prey. We're ants. You know, we're we're what they put underneath the magnifying glass and see which one lasts the longest. It just it, it never made any sense to me to take that direction, at least for the amount that they actually explored it. That any kind of predator would right. ever try to help humanity against the bigger you know race of predators and they never even explain why these predators are going rogue like are they do they believe that genetic modification is like an abomination like they don't want anything to do with it and now those that are genetically modified and more superior are trying to wipe them out like we never get to explore any of that we just get told this predator doesn't like this predator go with it and it's, it doesn't really make any sense because even in predators, whenever we have the two different races of predators, they at least explain it better. There's a blood feud between this type of predator and this type of predator. They're similar, but not exactly the same. And they're so tribal, you can buy into that right away because tribes fight. But when you get into this, where it's this intergalactic battle against rogue predators and genetically modified predators, we're just told to go with it. Like right. That's a major change for the predator lore that we're just supposed to go with. Right. And there's like you could even as you're saying it, there's easy ways to explain it. They're the yeah. smaller ones. They're about to go extinct. And they know that humans are about to go extinct because of what's kind of going on. So their thought is I'll team up with the remaining we know the big ones are coming to Earth soon, so we'll team up with these humans to battle them and the humans with their whatever they might say humans have. There's an argument there. You go, OK, that makes some logical sense. They didn't say that in the movie, but they yeah. could have said that. And even to that point of if we're going to have kind of like this rogue that wants to partner with humanity, the way the story plays out, he's killed off as soon as he gets interesting. Like I, when he died, mm -hmm. I was like, no, I wanted to spend more time with it. Like I wanted to. Like I was kind of attached to that guy. Like what? And he's just gone. What? Mm -hmm. What? And like that would have been a mechanism. There could have been some interesting things to do with that. Or you have little kid on the spectrum is able to communicate with like there's any number of different things you could have done that would have been like a better version of what they were trying to do that would like explain it. That's not just Sterling K. Brown shows up and goes, oh, what they're trying to do is here's 10 different things that there's no reason to know. But they could have done it all these other ways, but they didn't do yeah. that. And we'll get into that a little bit with reshoots that might fill in a little bit of that, but mm -hmm. it doesn't work in the movie that they gave us. Yeah, and even a small thing that it kind of bothered me too, it didn't like stick with my head very much throughout the movie. I just kind of went with it, but it didn't make any sense was how one of his like predator dogs suddenly switches sides just right. because it got shot in the head. Like it's mentally weak now. I'm like, and I had somebody use that argument because I had somebody on Killer Flicks that was like, that didn't make any sense. And then somebody chimed in. They explained it. He got shot in the head, so he was mentally messed. I'm like, that's probably not how that works. That makes yeah. about as much sense as the adamantium bullet in X-Men Origins Wolverine. So, yeah, that's my little ditty on that. Right. Well, and, it, and it just kind of, it's one of these things that turns into this very weird lingering plot point that mm -hmm. you don't know why it's there. Because it's like the yeah. dog shows up. It's our friend. And then she grabs a grenade and plays fetch with it. And it disappears for 10 minutes and then he just happens to show up right at the moment where she needs a grenade to take a guy out. Yeah. And, and then later in the movie, it's like, Hey, we got to have an adventure. So she grabs some technology, throws it into the back of a truck to lock him in the back of the truck. So it's like, they keep trying to get rid of the dog mm -hmm. so that they can do something else. Just so the dog can douse sex machina show up right at the right moment to save the day. Yeah. And it's like this very weird plot line that was kind of thrown in there. And the only reason it works is because he got shot in the head and suddenly is lobotomized and becomes friends with them. Like that, yeah. like you can say that, like, okay, that's, but that's cheap, lazy writing is what it is yes. to do just like, he got shot in the head and now he's on the other side. What? What? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so then move to the very end of the movie there. The whole time they're trying to get the thing that he, that he was trying to give to us. That'll save the day. What's this interesting thing that might happen? And then we get to the end of the movie and we still don't know what it was. And they're like, hey, they jettisoned it. And we get this final scene and um, we've just got Boyd and his son. None of the other cast members from the movie. So probably a reshot mm -hmm. scene. And they have this big dramatic scene where this thing's gonna open. What's it gonna be? What's inside of the box? And then something jumps out onto a guy and it's moving up and, oh no, is it gonna kill him? Oh no, it's just the Iron Man suit from yeah. Infinity War. Except, it, yeah. you know, it's a predator suit. It's like, what? 
That's literally what my son would say. My six year old son, he would be like, oh, it would be so cool is what if like the humans got a predator suit, except it had like three missile launchers on each of his shoulders. That's what my son would say. It's like the most base level, like what's cool? A person in cool armor with a bunch of missile launchers and flamethrowers in his hands. That's literally what my son says every day. It's why he loves Boba Fett. He's got a jetpack and a flamethrower. And that's how this movie ends. You're like, that's my new suit. Hope it comes in a 44 long. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was horrendous. Now, let me ask you, what did you think it was going to be? I was I was having this weird thing like that, like this was actually going in my head. I, I don't know if I'm saying this makes me sound ridiculous or anything. I had this odd thing. What if they're going to try and bridge this to Terminator? I had that thought. I had I had these as soon as he said he's the cybernetic expert. Mm-hmm. I, I thought the same exact thing. Okay. I said I said this is weird. I said what if they're trying to merge these yeah. two franchises together? Because there's the another Terminator one coming, coming out yeah. ne- next year. We know Arnold's in it, and I like. Are they really about to do this? No, it's it's the Iron Man suit. Dude, I swear that's hilarious. I thought it was ridiculous when I was thinking. I was like, I think I'm the only person that would think of this ridiculous crap right now. And it's hilarious because I, I swear I was like, what if they're going to make it? This is how the T1, T-800 was made. Like it's going to be Arnold and yeah. it's going to be half Predator and half Terminator. Because I think there's been Terminator versus oh, yeah, Predator yeah. video games certainly. and stuff. Yeah, so I, I I thought two things. At first, I thought the whole movie. I was like, that's got to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like they, he's going to come out and they've genetically modified right. him, or he's in Predator armor. It's going to be Schwarzenegger. That's the yeah. only thing that would be mm-hmm. cool enough to build it up this much. Because they mention mm-hmm. it and they have visual cues to this box like ten times in the movie. I'm like, right. it's got to be something big. I said it would be disappointing, but it would even be somewhat passable if it's Adrian Brody. If it's something that ties it to the other movies in a somewhat cool way. Arnold would be the best one. But when they, they said this is the cybernetic expert, I said, oh, my God, are they going to do Terminator? <laughs> and I was waiting for I was waiting for dun, 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 yeah, dun, right. dun. And I was like, I don't know if that would be the weirdest thing ever or the most awesome thing ever. I don't know how I'd react to that. But I was thinking the so same thing. So if we thing, were both then, thinking that, anyone in the comment section, were you also thinking Terminator? Because if both of – like him and I think alike, that's why I have him on here. That's why we're good friends. But mm-hmm. maybe you guys, everyone was maybe thinking that same exact thing, and we just haven't mentioned it in the comment sections yet on the video. Is that we were waiting for Arnold to come out as the T-800 or something like that. Um, mm. Now, if they'd done that, would you have loved that? Or would you, like, just mind blown, I don't know what to do with it? Like, what would you have done with that? Because I, I don't know. I, like, my heart was starting to pound a little bit. Like, are they about to do this? I don't know I'm going to respond if Arnold <laughs> comes out as the Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> my shit was pounding too. I was doing the same thing. I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna. Re- I'm ready for this. I don't know if this is. I haven't been prepared. Yes. Like, but no, I don't know. I would have been shell shocked for a minute. I probably would have immediately got on Google and tried to research. Like, what does this mean? Like, you know. So, is this Sarah Connor movie coming out? Is that just a, a facade? And it's just gonna be a Predator Terminator movie? But or is yeah. that why the the the, the shot all the photos they put out were only about the ladies in the movie? Is because they yeah. had to hide the fact that it's going crazy, and so they're like, this is what the movie's gonna be about. But no, it's actually this crossover movie. But no, it's the Iron Man suit. All right, all right, right, let's move on to the next thing. Um, The storytelling or the edit here. We've touched on this a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Even before the movie shifted to bonkers in the second half, I, I even thought the first half of the movie felt like it was jumping forward a lot. Like yeah. in a sequence where the um, predator escapes, the actual part where he's escaping and killing people, it's cool. And then as, as soon as he starts to get out of the building and Olivia Munn starts chasing him and the loonies are kind of driving around and everything, it felt to me like it was hopping around too fast uh, in what was happening. And But then as you move later into the movie, the, I mean, it just... How it's cut together and plot lines just kind of forced. Uh, it just gets bonkers. Yeah, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, same thing. It felt like it was, and I, that's what kind of disappoints you about the third act because it feels like they were trying to rush through some things, like exposition wise and character moment. They were trying to rush through something to get to this bigger stuff that they had maybe waiting <laughs> in the third act, but it never comes. Yeah. So I don't know if maybe with they had to do the reshoots and they were trying to cut the movie down, if they were just trying to find like, 
30 seconds here. There's a minute there and just chopping little yeah. pieces out of the movie to maybe save the Edward James almost storyline or to maybe save this sequence, but it wasn't quite good enough. So then we're just left with like the Batman V Superman cut where they're just, mm -hmm. just little tiny cuts of scenes, change it <laughs> drastically and change the flow of the movie right. drastically. So that's exactly what it felt like. It right. felt like there was just weird editing choices all the way through the first two acts, and then the third act is just like this huge timeline yeah. extravaganza going on. <laughs> right, well, and so even before I read the article where it talks about just how much was cut and reshot and everything, I wrote down in my notes, this movie feels like it was two and a half hours long Cut to yeah. 150 minutes, hour and 50 yeah. minutes. Uh, and I didn't I hadn't read the stuff about almost I, all that. I didn't know any of that stuff other than that there were some reshoots for it. And I felt like, man, they really tighten this thing up. And I like it feels to me like sometimes when I do my videos, I give myself like a time limit limit. I want it to be 10 minutes long. I want it to be 11 minutes long. But my first mm -hmm. cut is 15 minutes long. And so I have to just start cutting things in sentences and try and force things to work together. And so you just feel like mm -hmm. you're flying through things way too fast when you do that. And it's it's never the best way to do things. It's the best ways to write it that way and shoot it that way if you wanted 150 minutes or make it two and a half hours long. But he, like you're watching through the movie and um, they're trying to get the kid. And so then you have this plot line where there's special agents at the house um, with uh, Boyd's wife who disappears out of the movie uh, very suddenly. Like she's yeah. in the first half and she's not in the second half at all. And she's like, oh, no, he went out. Uh, trick or treated and so then they're trying to find him and it just like jumps through like there's a stuff at his house and then they're trying to do trick or treating and then we're just off to doing something else like just jumping through these plot lines that so fast that makes absolutely no sense to just jump so quickly through all these different things but that's what happens when you take a movie that's this long and you make it this long and then reshoot the second half of it to do, do something completely different mm-hmm yeah, exactly. It, it ruins the flow of the movie. And then from there, we'll move on to the cause of all this, the reshoots. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad Screen Rant put that article together because it, it, it fills in so many different things. And as soon as you read it and they start linking to things that I didn't, I mean, legitimately, they show set photos of a tank with all the loonies in it and two predators sitting on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then if you go back and watch the trailers, you see scenes of this AV daytime sequence. And I remember that in the trailers, like there's a daytime uh, scene of a guy like shooting, the, the, the black dude shooting a, um, a 50 caliber Thanks. machine gun mm -hmm. and it's not in the movie. And yeah. likewise, these cars flipping over and I was like, I don't, where would that even fit into the movie as I was thinking about it? And then you read this article. If you guys haven't read the article, essentially what happened was there's this whole plot line about Edward James almost who runs area 51 and there's two predators at area 51 that end up getting loose and teaming up with the loonies sometime between Halloween night and the third act of the movie. And there's this whole daytime shootout that was supposed to happen. That's not there. And so they wanted to trim the movie down. So they cut, this whole subplot out of the movie about Area 51 and all this backstory stuff. And they gave all the dialogue to Sterling K. Brown. So suddenly he becomes the exposition dump guy in the second half of the movie. And so he kidnaps the loonies and he's sitting down and he's just like telling Olivia Munn their backstory and information, which makes no sense in light of the movie that's there. But if you know, Edward James almost was supposed to be in the movie and was kind of the boss guy that knew more. You go, oh, we were supposed to get this information from someone else. Mm -hmm. But yeah, wow, frustrating. Very frustrating yeah, read. That, that whole thing, uh, the, the directions that he was going to go with the genetic modifications and like these these failed attempt experiment predators that the, the antagonistic predator was going to release that were going to have like extra arms and like appendages from other species and stuff. Like it sounds so weird and wacky that it makes sense. But it, it, it's something that it might not have worked, but it definitely should have been in the movie because they trail all the way to that just to go in a completely different direction and cut it off at its knees. And that would have been an interesting sequence to have predators facing off against abomination experiment mm -hmm. predators and the alpha 
you know, the experiment that worked Predator trying to take everybody out, <laughs> daytime action sequences with gunfire, like, like all that stuff. It's like, why would you cut that of anything? Right. And it, it's, you know, it, I heard like back in March, I remember hearing, you know, all oh, the Predators going through massive reshoots, but, you know, with the thing that me and you do with DC, where we talk about Ben Affleck every five days and everything, where it, it, you kind of have to defend that stuff after a while. Right. You're like, look, look, it, it, reshoots are a normal thing. Calm down. They probably had some issues here. It, hopefully it ends up being a better movie. Calm down. But this right. unfortunately ends up being one of the situations that we talk about a little bit too often nowadays, like Justice League, where you have movie A, studio decides they don't want movie A after they've already hired director A, so they change completely mm-hmm. the complete dna of the movie and then you end up with this hodgepodge that just feels like multiple movies spun into one like, let's just make it work and throw it out there and it just it's extremely disappointing whenever you hear something like that because what could have been like are we going right. to get an ultimate edition cut with the actual shane black movie and then you know then warner brother or, um is this warner brothers yes it is warner brothers this is fox this Fox. Is Fox. That's right. Never mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. So Fox. So you have Fox pulling WB where they're like, oh, sorry, we were wrong. Shane Black was right. But it just, I never understand the, the studio's decision making. If you hire a director like Shane Black, who's both, he's equally famous and infamous for doing these wacky off the wall, you know, subverting expectation decisions. Why do you hire a guy like that if you just want vanilla Predator sequel? You know what I mean? I just, I don't understand it. That's where for me, what was confusing is even... If he comes in with this script that's yeah. very long, tons of plot lines, and you green light it, and then you go, oh, things aren't working, let's make it an hour and 50 minutes. Like I, did, like, I don't know how anyone doesn't hear that and go, of course that's going to fail. Of course yeah. that's going to make for a bad movie if you do that. If you rework yeah. it and trim it so much, it's going to feel like a Frankenstein movie, which it does. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You, you just like how many how many plot holes, time issues, just blatant, fundamental, technical issues with the movie were introduced because of these reshoots. Uh, some of it I, I can't believe, like the Halloween line where Sterling K. Brown says the one you mentioned before about this mask was used on Halloween. How does it work? And in the t- timeline of the released movie, that happened two hours ago. Mm-hmm. It just happened. How did that make it into a wide released movie that they didn't even do like ADR? They didn't do anything to fix such a stupid line is shocking to mm-hmm. me. But that's what happens when you're trying to like, like last minute salvage a movie that you decided to radically transform. Yeah. And but you then, can even tell if you look at the CGI surrounding this big alpha predator, because like in the sequence that we see in the trailers where he throws the regular size predator and all of a sudden he's like five times bigger, he still doesn't look awesome. He still looks a little video gamey for me because predators have always been kind of practical. Yeah. But when you get to the third act and you see like a scene where he's up in the trees and he's biting a dude's head off, it looks like. I mean, it's it's borderline the rock, the mummy bad. Like it, it's it's not to take it too far, but I mean, it's it's such a shift in quality yeah. that even that you can tell they were rushing and didn't have time to even fully render the CGI yeah. character in these reshoots. It would be on the basic, like even stepping back from even CGI level, that sequence. So the movie's supposed to end with the hybrids coming out this big showdown. They scrap all that plot line. So then they streamline it to. The predator chases them through the woods like in the other movies. And so the whole thing is shot haphazardly. Like when Sterling K. Brown dies. (laughs) I didn't know for 15 years. I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, wait. Oh, so he did die. Like, I don't. And I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know what happened to him when he died. And I like I watched a couple other reviews where they were talking about it. Like, oh, I didn't know he died either. And no one's explained exactly. Do you know how he died? Yeah, that little uh, plasma caster that he had on his shoulder, it, it, it's a second. I mean, it's literally a second yeah. that it happens. He turns to shoot something, and it shoots himself in the head. Okay, like, the okay. Way, he aims at something that's too far this way, and it blows his head off. But it's literally like, yeah. it, it, it's like flash. Yeah. And when it happened, I literally, I was like, who's that? And right. then I just realized 10 minutes later, oh, well, Sterling K. Brown hasn't been in the movie in 10 minutes. I guess it was him. Yeah, and he's the one that had it on his shoulder. So it like, but I mean, just... In the movie, built him up as the guy you want either the predator 
to take out in a horrible way or for at the end of the movie they win and Boyd has survived he survived and Boyd just walks up to him and blows his head off yeah, that's okay. what they built the move up movie to be wait did he just die yeah. and it was right after Boyd does you know like one of these great lines like we're not done yet. Like when this is over, we're going to dance. And then sternly kicking around. I got my shoes. Like there's this nice little interaction. Two minutes later. Yep. And, and, um, and you read in the article about what was the way all this was supposed to play out is that the loonies and all these characters were supposed to be killed off over a span of like 30 minutes. You're yeah. supposed to be the entire second half of the movie. They're slowly being killed off in this big gigantic battle or a series of battles. And then in the movie we get, it's just like, they're killed off three minutes apart from each other. They've yep. survived an hour and 40 minutes into the movie. And then from an hour and 40 minutes to an hour and 43 minutes, all of them are killed off. Yeah. And some of them almost unceremoniously. They got one guy where they just, I think they just thought of a kind con- like, we got to throw some cool stuff in this reshoot. Like, how would it be cool if somebody got appendages cut off by a force field? Yeah. That does sound cool. Let's just kill random, let's just randomly yeah. kill one of the main characters of the movie with yeah, no ceremony like, whatsoever. Jump, and nobody, jump, yeah. jump. And he just, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? And you just, one guy goes under, <laughs> one guy's on top of it, and the guy's like, I don't know. And it cuts his, cuts his legs off. Yeah. And then he flies <laughs> off and he's dead. And with like bad CGI. Way. Yeah. yeah. Bad CGI. Woo. Like, Everybody's just like, oh, well, what were we doing? And they just kind of move on, which is kind of the tone they had the whole movie. Like, I know they're supposed to be crazy and loony. That's why they have the loony name. But there's not a single character in this entire movie that takes the movie seriously. And this is the only movie in this franchise that does that. Like, even the bad Predator movies, they still take themselves 100% seriously. So when things are supposed to be scary, when things are supposed to be tense, when there's what should be frightening, like life altering things going on. They're just like, ah, another day in the, you know, another day in the bar. And they're just kind of shooting things and people die left and right. Ah, screw it. You know what I mean? They're spouting off mama jokes and it just, if the movie had been hilarious, I guess you could kind of buy into it. But even that just feels like a bad direction to go, which I got to lay the blame on Shane Black, unfortunately. And that's what makes it so interesting is you go, okay, the movie would have been much more cohesive if we'd gotten the original version of it. That's mm-hmm. what it was building towards. You remove all these weird continuity timeline issues and you don't even know some like when was the the invisibility thing supposed to come back? And like there's several different things about it. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. how it would have played out differently, but it would have played out far more smoothly. But then you still go. There's a bunch of issues here that still just like and maybe the loonies would have worked better if the movie took place over a week. Yeah. And it builds towards it and they're traveling. And so you get and you get more time to breathe and to get the rapport going. But the movie we got. Mm. I, weird. Very. <laughs> Very weird movie. And as we both said, probably almost certainly going to be both of our most disappointing movies of the year. And as we also said, not the worst. There's there's some garbage that's come out this year with no redeeming qualities. This is the one that was just like it could have been here. Even with some of the ideas, some of the things in there, it could have been here, but it's not. Exactly. So anyway, did you uh, um, I guess what what did you score the movie and what's kind of your score system on your channel? Um, well, I've got I go from well, I have one that's kind of profanity fueled for like the absolute worst trash that I could possibly imagine. That's like the the lowest thing I could possibly give it. Then I go to skip it, see it on Netflix, which basically just means, yeah, I recommend that you see it eventually, but no rush to see it. You can wait two years for Netflix to pick it up, see it in theaters at a matinee, see it in theaters full price, and then go out and buy it, which is kind of like my highest recommendation. And I gave this, it, it barely skated by with see it on Netflix. And it's only because I have talked to people that I know their movie tastes are similar to mine and they still really enjoy the movie and I respect their opinion. So I think that there's a very equal chance when you walk into this movie that you're either going to be on one side or the other. And there's not really a, a said spectrum for which end you're going to end up on until you see it. So I gave it the lowest possible numeric score to land it on see it on Netflix. So for me, um, uh, so I gave it a C minus seven out of 10, which would mean mm-hmm. I don't think it's good, but I had fun mm-hmm. with it. But I'm yeah. not sure if I would if I rewatch it, if I'll be like, oh, yeah, I still had fun with it. Or if I'll be like, I can I all I see is how bad it is. Mm-hmm. And maybe to some extent, this could be a movie that the nature of the badness is so 
interesting to me. It mm-hmm. piques my curiosity of like, how did they this happen? How did such a train wreck end up on the screen? Then maybe mm-hmm. that could even be a positive for the movie. But that's kind of my take. This isn't a good movie. This is a pretty bad movie, but a very watchable, not good movie. Agreed. Um, that's kind of my final take on it. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Everybody, be sure to head on over to Cody's channel. Click that subscribe button on his channel. Tell him that I sent you over there. Cody, tell us where we can find you and any final words you want to give us. I mean, you can just search my name, Cody Leach, and I'll pop up, or you can just go to youtube.com slash Cody Leach channel, and you will find me there. Um, Like I said, if you're a horror fan, I got tons of horror stuff over there, getting ready to do the Halloween franchise leading up to the new one. So if you have Halloween fever, definitely hit that subscribe button, and we'll, uh, we'll go through the series together. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews, TV reviews, ranking videos. But the key thing is I don't want to just talk about movies. I want to talk about movies with you. So join us down in the comment section. Tell us your take on this very interesting film. And as always, thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.